Is it so? It's Good morning in the annual conference of the Bank of Latvia. A sustainable economy in times of change. There will be two languages, working languages, simultaneous interpreting. And I'll pass now over to English. Live broadcast of the conference will be available on web page macroeconomics.lv, on our web page on Facebook, as well as on news agency Lepta web page. Conference will last approximately until 5 o'clock. Uh, it has two parts with 15 minutes break between. Uh, you can ask questions. Questions will be on uh, platform Slido with hashtag LB conference, hashtag LB conference. And full agenda of the conference available on web page uh, macroeconomics.lv. And now, short welcome by Governor of Latvijas Banka, the member of Governing Council of ECB, Martinš Kazaks. Martinš, the stage is yours. Labdien, kolēģi, kolēģis, uh, hello, colleagues. Uh, it is my true pleasure and honor to welcome you at the annual conference of Latvijas Banka. The virtual format of the conference makes it possible to address you from the knowledge center of Latvijas Banka, which we call the world of money. Uh, and it is very symbolic. During times of change, knowledge is the most important to provide insights about the future. It means ability to see interlinkages, ability to see further ahead, ability to have a long-term vision how today's decisions will affect our lives for many years to come. The conference will have two panel discussions. The first panel discussion called monetary and fiscal policy interplay or fight uh, will discuss the new playing field. This is time. This time we have seen massive monetary and fiscal support during this crisis. It has been necessary, but how do we move forward? How to make effective and sustainable policy choices? How to shape interaction between monetary and fiscal policy going forward? The European Central Bank conducted its strategy review this year, a major event since the previous one was conducted in 2003. For the first time, the new strategy talks about climate change. And it is not a whim. It's a fundamental change that will affect our societies and our policies. Therefore, the second panel discussion, which is called Moving Towards Sustainable Development, will focus on such issues, but with a focus on the Latvian situation. Today's smart choices can build a better future for all of us. Pollution will become more expensive. For instance, are we ready to pay 250 to 300 euros per ton of CO2? Already in 2030, as the baseline scenarios currently uh, outline. Of course, we are not. Nobody is at the current moment, and that's why we need to discuss how to go about it. Common understanding among policymakers, fiscal policy, financial markets, and wide society is crucial here. And uh, the second panel will discuss both the current situation that Latvia is in and the opportunities and the expected role of the financial sector, sector to resolve those issues. I wish us all today interesting discussions and brilliant ideas. But it is not only about generating the ideas. It is about implementing them. We at the Bank of Latvia will do so. We will implement those ideas, and we encourage to do so all the rest of us. Thank you. Thank you, Martinš. We will meet Martinš Kazaks again in the first panel discussion of our conference. But now I would like to give the floor for keynote speech form by Isabel Schnabel, member of the Executive Board of European Central Bank. Welcome, Isabel. Good afternoon. I hope you can all hear me well. Maybe you can confirm. Okay, thank you. So dear Governor Kazakhs, dear Martin, dear Mr. Svilans, ladies and gentlemen, it's a real pleasure and honor to give today's keynote speech at uh, Latvia's Banka's um, annual economic conference. And uh, I will talk about asset purchases 
from crisis to recovery. And I would be grateful if you could uh, set up my slides. So I cannot see the slides. Excellent. Thank you very much. Maybe you can go to the first slide. Thank you. So I, I would like to discuss today asset purchases and uh, how the use of asset purchases by the European Central Bank is changing when moving from crisis to recovery. So asset purchases have become a very important tool for central banks worldwide in order to secure price stability in the vicinity of the zero lower bound. The experience over the past decade has yielded many insights into how precisely asset purchases affect financial and economic conditions. The latest example is, of course, the response to the coronavirus pandemic. There is by now broad consensus that asset purchases can support economic growth and inflation in three main ways. First, through the market stabilization channel by which asset purchases provide liquidity when there are deep dislocations in financial markets. Second, through the portfolio rebalancing channel by which asset purchases reduce the aggregate amount of duration risk to be held by price sensitive investors, inducing a shift into other riskier assets in the economy and thereby supporting their value. And third, through the signaling channel by which asset purchases signal the intention of central banks to keep policy rates lower for longer. In my remarks today, I would like to explain how the relative importance of these three channels has changed during the course of the pandemic. I will argue that the Pandemic Emergency Purchase Program, in short PEP, prevented the collapse of the financial system when the pandemic shock hit our economies. A strong market presence, as well as flexibility in the way purchases are conducted, are the most prominent features of the market stabilization channel, supporting confidence and the economy as a whole. I will then show that once market functioning had recovered and the repercussions of the pandemic for the medium term inflation outlook became clearer, the portfolio rebalancing channel became the PAP's main transmission channel. Sizable duration extraction has been the main factor supporting the economy and the inflation outlook during this phase. And finally, I will explain how the signaling channel is becoming more important as our measures succeed in dispelling tail risks and lifting the expected future path of inflation. It reinforces our new forward guidance and reduces uncertainty about the future path of short-term interest rates. Next slide, please. Just before the Governing Council launched the PEP in March 2020, financial markets had frozen under the weight of rising uncertainty, and this is illustrated in my first slide. Liquidity dried up even in deep liquid markets, such as the German Bund market. Corporate bond spreads skyrocketed and stock markets plummeted at an unprecedented pace. In such periods of acute financial market stress, asset purchases are a powerful instrument to protect monetary policy transmission. Falling asset values and rising credit and counterparty risk typically imply that the risk-bearing capacity of most financial intermediaries is severely constrained at a time when duration supply is expected to rise. Government expenditure, for example, tends to increase in the early stages of a crisis to mitigate the economic and social repercussions of the ensuing downturn. During the pandemic, corporate liquidity needs also rose sharply. Asset purchases can fill the void and allow the market to return to the good equilibrium. They reduce the frictions that prevent arbitrage across asset classes. What matters in those circumstances are two criteria, a strong market presence and flexibility. A strong market presence helps, helps overcome transitory supply and demand imbalances. In the first two weeks of the PEP, the Eurosystem purchased assets worth more than 50 billion euro. 
By the end of June 2020, the asset purchases amounted to more than 350 billion euro, an enormous pace of absorption. Next slide, please. ECB staff analysis confirms that asset purchases are particularly effective in periods of market stress. The evidence around the PEP announcement suggests that the normalized impact of a 500 billion euro purchase envelope is likely to be noticeably higher than under our regular asset purchase program, APP. And this is shown on the left-hand side graph on this slide. There's also evidence that flow effects, that is, the impact on bond prices that goes beyond the announcement effect or stock effect tend to be larger under stressed conditions as displayed on the right hand side. This is consistent with the idea that investors value central bank liquidity most when markets dry up. The second criterion is flexibility. Market segmentation in periods of stress implies that asset purchases mostly operate locally with limited spillovers to non-targeted segments. As a result, central banks have to intervene more directly in those market segments where it is most needed. The PEP's flexibility over time across asset classes and among jurisdictions explicitly catered for the possibility of such targeted purchases. Next slide, please. And this is displayed on this slide. So, for example, in the early days of the crisis, we had a strong presence in the commercial paper market. So, these are the yellow bars, where the demand for liquidity was high, but trading activity was largely absent. As market conditions stabilized, we were able to gradually scale down our activities in this market segment. Similarly, at the onset of the crisis, perceptions of differences in fiscal policy space are likely to have contributed to widening the wedge between the financing costs of euro area sovereigns and hence of firms, banks and households in different parts of the single currency area. By allowing for greater flexibility in the way public sector assets are purchased, we were able to counter such risks of harmful fragmentation. At the height of the market turmoil, when fragmentation risks threatened to impair monetary policy transmission, there were substantial deviations from the ECB's capital key, which guides the allocation of our public sector purchases across your area countries, as shown on the right hand side. But these deviations receded swiftly. Over most of the PEP's lifetime, purchases have been conducted according to the capital key. This does not mean that flexibility became irrelevant in the later stages of the crisis. Quite on the contrary, the option to conduct purchases flexibly ultimately provided a backstop that prevented fragmentation risks from resurfacing in the first place. Overall, the success of our interventions has been overwhelming. Indicators of financial stress dropped quickly as the PEP instilled confidence, restored orderly liquidity conditions, and stopped and then reverted destabilizing price spirals and fire sales. In short, the launch of the PEP prevented the collapse of the financial system. As the dust of the initial shock settled, the purpose of the PEP shifted from market stabilization to ensuring an appropriate monetary policy stance. In June 2020, our staff projection suggested that inflation would be well below our target in the medium term and noticeably below the pre-pandemic level. At that point, portfolio rebalancing became the main transmission channel of our asset purchases. Although we could afford to reduce our monthly emergency interventions over the second half of 2020 by 45 percent compared with their peak in light of karma financial markets, exceptionally large public and private duration supply in response to the pandemic was a recurring source of upward pressure on bond yields that would not have been consistent with our commitment to counter the effect of the pandemic on the inflation trajectory. Next slide, please. ECB estimates suggest, as shown on the left-hand slide, 
that the GDP weighted 10 year yield of the four largest euro area countries would have been more than 50 basis points higher in response to the increase in public debt. Duration extraction offset this effect and engineered a decline in the bond free float, that is, the share of bonds held by price sensitive investors, thereby keeping yields at levels consistent with countering the downward impact of the pandemic on the projected path of inflation, shown on the right-hand side. Over time, however, as tail risks dissipate and the outlook gradually improves, the portfolio balance rebalancing channel may at some point become less important. There are two main reasons for this. First, there can be diminishing returns to portfolio rebalancing. Over time, measures of risk compensation adjust in a way that makes purchasing riskier assets less attractive to investors. There may be a point where the effects could even reverse. Evidence from the United States, for example, suggests that when the supply of safe government bonds is falling, market participants attach a higher value to the liquidity and safety attributes of such assets, a value known as the convenience yield. If this convenience yield is not available from other assets, then progressively reducing the quantity of safe government bonds in the market may no longer be welfare increasing. Another argument arises when considering the consolidated balance sheet of the government and the central bank. Swapping long-term government bonds for overnight central bank reserves results over time in a notable shortening of the maturity structure of public liabilities. In other, word, in other words, it de facto counteracts the efforts by governments to lock in current low interest rates with a view to reducing their exposures to potentially higher interest rates in the future. Next slide, please. Second, the stock of acquired assets ensures no undue or premature decompression of the term premium, even if the effects of portfolio rebalancing diminish. So far during the pandemic, the euro system has bought assets worth more than 1.3 trillion euro, or nearly 12% of last year's euro area GDP under the PEP alone, together with the purchases under the APP, we currently hold around 4.4 trillion worth of securities on our balance sheet. So I see the wrong slide, so you would have to move one on, please. No, the previous one, please. Yes, thank you. ECB simulations uh, show, and this shown on the right hand slide, that this stock provides substantial and persistent policy stimulus. Even in three to five years' time, our joint PSPP and PEP holdings can be expected to put sizable downward pressure on interest rates across the maturity spectrum. These effects do not imply, however, that asset purchases no longer play a role once economic conditions and the inflation outlook uh, improve and the need for portfolio rebalancing diminishes. In fact, in these circumstances, the signaling channel of asset purchases often gains importance. Past experience suggests that when projected inflation gradually approaches the target, uncertainty about the future path of interest rates increases. Forward guidance on interest rates can substantially reduce this uncertainty. It can stabilize long-term interest rates by enhancing clarity on the conditions that must be met for policy rates to increase. At our governing council meeting in July, we laid out three such conditions for the euro area. First, inflation needs to reach 2% well ahead of the end of our projection horizon. Second, inflation needs to stay there durably for the rest of the projection horizon. And third, realized progress in underlying inflation needs to be sufficiently advanced to be consistent with inflation stabilizing at 2% over the medium term. Next slide, please. There is evidence that our new guidance has been effective in reducing uncertainty about future policy. The relationship between expected inflation and expected future interest rates, shown on this slide, has changed in the pandemic. Today, 
Markets expect less monetary policy tightening for each incremental improvement in the medium-term inflation outlook. The sensitivity of rate expectations to changes in the inflation outlook has remained the same even as the balance of risks around the inflation outlook priced in by investors had no, has noticeably shifted to the upside. Next slide, please. Option prices, for example, shown on the left-hand side, currently suggest that the market attaches a probability of nearly 40% to inflation exceeding, on average, our 2% target over the next five years. Such market behavior is consistent with our pledge to act more patiently, that we want to see clearer signs that inflation is reliably moving towards our 2% target. Our September staff projections shown on the right hand side suggest that while the outlook is gradually improving, inflation is still expected to be below our 2% target in the medium term. As such, our new forward guidance has significantly enhanced clarity around our reaction function and has thereby helped anchor long-term rates at current low levels by reducing the uncertainty around the future course of monetary policy. In the early stages of a recovery, however, forward guidance cannot fully substitute for asset purchases. Therefore, forward guidance and asset purchases should be thought of as both substitutes and complements. They are substitutes in the sense that the main instrument to stabilize long-term yields at levels consistent with the inflation outlook, gradually shifts from asset purchases to forward guidance or from a compression of the term premium to managing the expected future path of short-term interest rates. They are complements in the sense that asset purchases can reinforce forward guidance. They can serve as a powerful commitment device to lend additional credibility to a central bank's forward guidance by signaling that, in all likelihood, the conditions for raising policy rates are not expected to materialize anytime soon. One reason is that investors typically do not expect a central bank to raise policy rates up abruptly when it is still conducting net asset purchases. Doing so would expose the central bank to significant losses on its balance sheet. Thereby, asset purchases raise the bar for lifting policy rates. In doing so, they support the central bank's pledge not to raise rates and therefore strengthen the commitment to forward guidance. This means that as the inflation outlook brightens, it becomes less important how much a central bank buys or when a reduction in the pace of asset purchases starts, but rather when such purchases end. This is the end date, which signals that the conditions for an increase in policy rates are getting closer. The precise sequencing and timing will, of course, require careful guidance when the time has come. Let me conclude. In my remarks today, I have taken stock of the changing role of asset purchases as we gradually transition from a period of crisis into the recovery phase. The pandemic has shown that asset purchases are an indispensable monetary policy instrument during times of market stress and economic downturns, when the room for interest rate cuts has largely been exhausted. After having calmed financial markets, our asset purchases have helped to bolster confidence and shore up the economy and the inflation outlook. As economic conditions begin to normalize and the inflation outlook improves, there is a gradual shift in the way asset purchases benefit the economy as a portfolio rebalancing channel makes way for the signaling channel. Asset purchases can increasingly serve as a powerful commitment device, reinforcing forward guidance and reducing uncertainty around the future course of monetary policy. Given the remaining uncertainty regarding the pandemic and the economic and inflation outlook, our asset purchases, both under the PEP and the APP, will remain crucial in the time to come, paving the way out of the pandemic and towards reaching our inflation target. Thank you very much. Thank you, Isabel Schnabel, member of the executive board of European Central Bank. Virtual world allows us to work from different places also in this conference too. Time for the next uh, part, our first panel discussion. And I hand over the moderation of this part to 
John O'Donnell. Hello and welcome. Nice to have you here today. And John, virtual stage is yours. Well, thank you very much. Thank you for uh, the invitation to moderate this illustrious panel. Uh, and we're here today from all corners of Europe uh, to discuss something which is uh, uh, preoccupying a lot of professors and academics around uh, the continent for a long time, the relationship between monetary and fiscal policy. And uh, I'd like to go around the virtual room from my seat here in Frankfurt, where I'm not too far from where Isabel is sitting in the European Central Bank Tower. Uh, we can see each other from across the Frankfurt skyline. And um, I would like to uh, also uh, say welcome to uh, the two participants from Riga, uh, Valdis Dombrovskis, somebody who I had the pleasure of meeting in Brussels when I was stationed there, and a person who understands European economic policy better than very few. Uh, he understands the Euro trade. He is now Executive Vice President of the European Commission responsible for economy and has a unparalleled insight into what we're going to discuss today. And also a welcome to Martin Kazaks, the Governor of the Latvian Central Bank and member of the Governing Council of the European Central Bank. Uh, we too met when I traveled to Riga and uh, it's a great pleasure to have you today on this panel to discuss the interplay between monetary and fiscal policy. And now we travel to Basel, uh, to Claudio Borio, who is the head of the Monetary and Economic Department of the Bank for International Settlements, the Central Bank for Central Banks, also someone with a great overview of global developments on this respect, and to Jordi Gali, in Spain uh, from the Center for Your Research in International Economics and also from the Barcelona Graduate School of Economics. Somebody in it with an esteemed economic experience and uh, great knowledge from his time in the United States as well as to how Europe is really performing in this crisis. And then um, perhaps to uh, start this uh, discussion, uh, I could turn to uh, Valdis Dombrovskis, uh, is I would like to ask you about your reflections on the pandemic and how Europe has responded to it, how it's managed to unveil unprecedented kind of fiscal stimulus also in a coordinated fashion around the European Union, and uh, also your reflections on how the Euro crisis has prepared us for this moment, because this is not the first crisis that uh, Europe has witnessed. Uh, good afternoon, and uh, first of all, I would like to thank uh, Bank of Latvia for inviting me to this annual uh, conference. Well, as regards uh, Europe's uh, response uh, to the crisis, uh, indeed, uh, Europe uh, uh, reacted boldly and in a coordinated way. We already uh, heard uh, about the monetary policy response to the crisis. Also, we provided a sizable fiscal stimulus. Uh, both uh, uh, concerning the providing flexibility to EU member states uh, through the activation of general escape clause and temporary state aid framework, uh, but also by setting up immediate crisis response uh, instruments such as SURE to su support uh, employment, temporary work schemes in member states, uh, pan-European guarantee fund by uh, uh, European Investment Bank, uh, if needed also uh, ESM's pandemic crisis support, uh, and right now we are already starting to implement the next generation EU and uh, the uh, uh, <coughs> economic recovery and resilience uh, facility. So the idea is uh, that uh, not only we are responding uh, to the crisis and not only to get the crisis back to its pre-crisis state, but also use this substantial fiscal stimulus which we are providing to the economy uh, to finance the green and digital transformation of the economy. So while we are now rebuilding the economy, also uh, finance its uh, transition to more sustainable stage. Uh, you mentioned the lessons from uh, previous uh, crisis. Uh, and indeed, many of the things which we have now in place are result of the 
uh, previous uh, crisis. This includes European uh, semester, our annual cycle to coordinate fiscal and macroeconomic uh, policies uh, across uh, member states. Uh, it includes uh, European uh, stability mechanism, which is uh, additional safeguard, which can provide, uh, if needed, uh, support for Euro uh, uh, area countries in uh, difficulties. We have a banking union with a single rule book, with a single supervisory mechanism, and we see that uh, during this crisis, banks are not part of the problem. Banks are part of the uh, solution. So, indeed, uh, there were many lessons which came from a previous uh, crisis which uh, helped us to change uh, the way we look at the macroeconomic policy, the way we look at the financial sector, and one can say that indeed we came better prepared to this crisis. There are uh, nonetheless uh, significant challenges ahead for Europe and achieving agreements in the European Union no one know, uh, will know better than you is often uh, plagued with uh, difficulty. What do you see as the challenges ahead for Europe uh, as we stand here today, fiscally and in terms of political cohesion? Uh, well, uh, 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 I would say the immediate challenge right now is implementation. We are uh, at the beginning of the new multi-annual financial framework, uh, 2021 to 2027. Uh, we are at the beginning of the European Economy Recovery Plan, uh, Next Generation EU and its Recovery and Resilience Facility. And just now, uh, member states to, to start to implement their recovery and resilience plans, where the idea is that not only we provide financing for additional investment, but we also link it with the structural reforms which member states need to undertake. So this is a first, in a sense, immediate uh, challenge to implement decisions which have been now taken uh, to overcome the crisis and now to recover the economy. Uh, looking forward, of course, we will need to deal with fiscal sustainability uh, risks because it's clear that we are coming out of this crisis which substantially higher debt levels and that concerns both uh, public and uh, private uh, debt. And soon we intend to relaunch the public consultation concerning the future of EU fiscal rules, where we will need to find the right balance on how, on one hand, to ensure fiscal sustainability, while at the uh, another hand to support economic recovery and a green and digital transformation of the economy. Perhaps I could uh, talk to your uh, uh, neighbour now, Mr. Kazakhs. Uh, greetings from Frankfurt and. Uh, of course, that was the fiscal side of the coin, but uh, we all know without uh, the extensive generosity of the central banks, we wouldn't be in the luxurious position we are in today. But the, this uh, generosity, this uh, financial support that the central banks has offered, has it perhaps made it a little bit too easy on governments to uh, build up debts? And um, you know, what, what, what signals ought to be sent so that that doesn't uh, materialize, that it's uh, turned into a free check for governments. Thank you, John. Um, I would also like to thank Isabel very much from ve for very insightful analysis on what the monetary policy has done and uh, what is the way forward as from the shoes, if I may say so, of monetary policy. Um, and. Uh, now, I would say two major things answering to your question is, uh, you know, take a look at the counterfactuals, what they would have been if the monetary policy would not have moved in. Uh, and it is clear that the uh, PEP program has been a success, a success in terms of timing. It was very swiftly put into action. It calmed financial markets. It averted a uh, financial meltdown. Okay? And, uh, I think it is, it is very, very uh, striking to look at this from the Latvian perspective here as well. We survived the crisis in 2008 and 2009, and, and Valdis has first-hand knowledge on this one. When the financial markets virtually froze over, it was impossible to borrow and to support the economy. Uh, this has not been the case now, of course, with the uh, very strong uh, intervention by the ECB and other major central banks. Um, which has allowed to stabilize the situation. So the pace, the timing, and the, the size of the uh, central bank intervention has been absolutely crucial. Uh, but, of course, um, it is not there forever. Uh, 
monetary policy cannot resolve structural problems. So, well, of course, we are back to the square uh, one when we discuss the structural issues, when we discuss fiscal sustainability issues. Um, I will remind that the ECB publicized its, uh, its uh, strategy review this summer. And we are very clear about the uh, monetary policy. Uh, and it is 2% symmetric medium term inflation target. Of course, what also we very clearly identified is at times when we are close to effective lower bound, when R star or equilibrium interest rate has been sliding down and is low, okay, uh, then monetary policy action needs to be forceful and persistent. And what does that mean? It means that we will be very careful in phasing out monetary stimulus. Even with PEP ending at some point, which we will, of course, only discuss. No decision is made about it. But support to the economy will be necessary. So the ECB will keep providing support to the economy. The moves are going to be exactly as uh, Isabel very clearly explained, carefully communicated to the market, timely, in a timely manner, and the steps taken will be cautious. But at the same time, of course, monetary policy is not the only game in town and cannot be the only game in town. Fiscal policy and structural policies are very important to put us on a path of sustainable, strong and fast recovery for all euro area countries. Thank you. You mentioned uh, that these uh, measures can't last forever and that at some point you have to uh, uh, call it a day and pare them back a little bit. How do you define that moment? Where do you see it as being reached, uh, Martin? Uh, at what point are we there and how should the unwinding look like? I think Isabel again very, very, very nicely put across the issue of, of asset purchases and forward guidance as being complements and substitutes at some point. And that's the story from the monetary policy uh, point of view. Let me add yet another thing. What we've seen over this crisis as well, that monetary policy and fiscal policy can work together. And this far we have seen that both have worked hand in hand to support the economies. Uh, but uh, at some point, those paths are bound to divert. Okay? Let's take a look at the, uh, at the very recent macro story, which, of course, with all its uncertainty, which is always there, is much better than it was a quarter ago, than it was half a year ago we see that by the end of this year, the euro area countries, in terms of their GDP levels, are going to be back to pre-COVID levels. We see that most likely, uh, during the next year, uh, out gaps will be closed. We see that inflation expectations have climbed significantly. So these are good news, both for macro and also for policymaking. But not yet, not yet, don't rush. And even with PEP ending uh, at some point, which as I said, we will discuss it okay, at the governing council and will come out when we see it appropriate with the decision. Okay. It does not mean that monetary support to the European economy uh, you know, it's, is ended, no. It only means that the pandemic phase would end, but monetary support would still be sufficient for the economy uh, so that we do not uh, put at risk this recovery and uh, do not uh, make reaching the target of 2% inflation impossible. So uh, there are elements to look at okay, in terms of inflation outlook, 
very clearly, as Isabel highlighted, the forward guidance that we have, but also, of course, in terms of, of the macro situation overall. Um, there will, of course, come some point when monetary policy will reduce the support of the economy, but it is not yet. Isabel, maybe I could turn to you uh, to ask you, which you, you addressed it also in your speech at the beginning, but maybe to kind of go back over some of the points you were making when the point has been reached, you know, how the future might look for us in terms of monetary policy when the job is done from these emergency measures. How do you envisage that and uh, uh, what do you see as the kind of key indicators and the important factors when it comes to deciding when the turning point has been reached? So thank you very much, uh, uh, John, for this question. So um, I think uh, Martin's described it uh, very nicely. What are the different types of indicators that we're looking at? So he rightly stressed that we have not yet taken any decision um, on, uh, on the path. And uh, I mean, I think it's, it's pretty clear that for the PEP, uh, the decision uh, depends uh, on how the pandemic uh, develops. So this is a program that is uh, clearly linked to the pandemic. And we always said that the program uh, will, uh, will be there uh, as long uh, as needed uh, in order uh, to counter the negative effect of the pandemic on our inflation uh, path. Um, and um, there, there are no like, clear criteria when the pandemic crisis phase ends, but this is in the end a decision of the governing council. And uh, uh, this decision of the uh, go uh, governing council uh, will come uh, in, the, uh, in the next month. So month with an S in the end, not next month, but... <laughs> so. Um, uh, so that's the one important point. But I think uh, what we have always stressed is that we are aware of the fact uh, that even um, uh, if at some point we decide to stop net asset purchases uh, under the PEP, uh, that it's clear that, or li very likely, that we have not yet reached uh, our inflation target of 2%. Uh, and therefore, we will have uh, to think very carefully about uh, what, what comes after that. And again, this is a decision uh, that still uh, has to be taken. But our uh, decisions are guided uh, by our inflation target of 2% in the medium term. Um, and um, I mean, currently, as also Martin stressed, uh, we're seeing some encouraging signs. Uh, so we are seeing that it's moving in the right direction. Uh, and I mean, some, uh, uh, some people talk about like um, inflation risks to the upside. So I would say uh, what we see at the moment is upside chances to the inflation outlook, given that inflation has been uh, so low for so long. Uh, I think uh, we have to be happy that inflation is moving up in the desired, uh, in the desired direction, uh, which uh, promises to bring us back to our inflation target. And this is uh, what we are concerned about. Do you, do you think that if the economy develops as you envisage it developing, that March would be the right time to change course? So again, this is something to be uh, decided uh, by the governing council. But uh, overall, um, uh, I think what we are seeing is, is very much uh, in line with uh, our projection so we, we do see a, a strong uh, recovery. Of course, we carefully uh, look at uh, potential uh, risks in all uh, directions. Um, uh, but currently, I think the recovery is well on track. What do you think will come after that uh, moment when, when, they, when there has been this change, of course? The old asset purchase program, I guess, needs to be maybe a little bit tweaked. Uh, uh, you mentioned in your speech about the point of capital key issuer limits. These are moving parts, I guess, within the old program, which was designed, you know, some years ago now, and the world has changed a lot. Is there, is there any room for flexibility in the way that program is executed when it, when it becomes the main uh, show again? 
So the, um, the APP um, is guided uh, by, the, uh, by the capital key. And um, I mean, we will have to consider moving forward whether we do think that any changes are, are needed. I would say that uh, the APP uh, has served us uh, very well. Um, also, the, I mean, the, the PEP will not have disappeared entirely, so there will still be um, a reinvestment going on under the PEP. So it's not that, the, uh, that if we at some point decide to stop net asset purchases that the PEP is simply uh, gone, but it's still there. The entire stock of the PEP is still there. Uh, this will have uh, a strong stabilizing effect and um, whether uh, we have to adjust uh, our programs going forward uh, will have to be decided by the governing council. And, and you mentioned, of course, that uh, the, you know, inflation coming back is a good thing. You know, I know this is a bit of a um, born of contention with people, right? Because they, they sometimes feel that inflation might be coming back a little bit too fast and too much. Somebody's kind of compared it to opening uh, or trying to get the tomato ketchup out of a tomato ketchup tube where nothing comes for ages and then suddenly it's all coming at the same time. Um, is, you know, is, is this inflation really something we can control? Is it really at the level that uh, we want it to be? And, uh, you know, do, do you see any potential risks with regards to inflation? Uh, so, of course, we are uh, watching the risks uh, very carefully. Uh, and uh, uh, of course, we are uh, we we are seeing spikes uh, in inflation, and I understand perfectly well that uh, people are worried about that. So part of that uh, is clearly driven by um, temporary factors such as uh, the the base effects uh, coming, uh, for example, um, from. Uh, the adjustment of the VAT in Germany or uh, by the, uh, the dramatic collapse in energy uh, prices uh, last year. Uh, but then, of course, there are other factors where we still believe they are transitory, but we don't know what that means uh, precisely. So everything related to uh, rising commodity prices, bottlenecks, uh, all types of supply chain disruptions. And I mean, we do believe, of course, that uh, these will wash out after some time. Uh, but of course, it's hard to predict how long uh, that will take uh, precisely. And this is something uh, that we are uh, that we are watching uh, very carefully. Um, I mean, we uh, what what we, of course, uh, are mostly interested in is inflation over the medium term and uh, a sustained increase uh, in inflation. And most economy, uh, economists and central bankers would agree that in order to get a sustained increase, what you would have to see uh, is uh, wage uh, increases, so like faster wage dynamics. And uh, this is something that so far we are not yet seeing. But of course, the data that we have on wages is, of course, backward looking. And so what we have to do is to, to look very carefully uh, at how wages uh, are developing and uh, whether we do see any signs uh, that uh, inflation may actually rise uh, more quickly uh, than, uh, than we expect. But I would like to stress that uh, given that inflation uh, has been so low over the past, uh, I think the bigger mistake uh, would be uh, to tighten uh, prematurely um, then uh, to wait a bit. And this is also uh, reflected in our new strategy and forward uh, guidance uh, that we want to be a bit more patient uh, in order to get inflation back to our uh, inflation target uh, of um, 2% uh, over the medium term. But of course, if we see that um, uh, inflation uh, moves much faster than we expect, then uh, we would have to react. Claudio, perhaps I can uh, turn to you uh, in Basel and uh, ask your view about these contentious issues, the interplay between monetary and fiscal policy, if they are really working in tandem, and also perhaps where you see uh, some of the risks. I mean, we just talked about inflation. That's something that some people blame on central banks. 
leaving governments to kind of uh, bear the political consequences. Uh, I'd be curious to hear your views. Well, uh, thank you, John. Um, let me say what, what I'd like to, to do is to elaborate a little bit on uh, some of the medium to longer term challenges that uh, were mentioned by, by the governor, for instance. Um, and by the way, what I'll be doing is drawing very much on uh, what we wrote in the annual economic report in, in June. So I very much encourage people to read that, to um, understand better what I have to say. And also there will be a set of written remarks uh, that elaborate a little bit on what I'll be saying now. <clears throat> To me, the most important, the toughest medium term challenge, longer term challenge that monetary policy and fiscal policy will be facing is the fact that over time, they will need to rebuild room for maneuver. They will need to rebuild safety margins. They will need to rebuild buffers. And that is because as we know, over time, this is not just something that happened during the COVID crisis. It's not something that happened post GFC, but something that is a longer term trend that goes back to the mid 1980s. They, both monetary and fiscal policy have lost room for policy maneuver. And uh, Isabel was very much talking about that in the context of monetary policy. Just a few numbers, because I'm not entirely sure that people are fully aware of this. Nominal interest rates we know are extraordinarily low. In fact, they've never been as low as one can tell uh, in history. Um, real interest rates have never been negative for as long as they have been uh, over the recent years, not even during the exceptionally exceptional great inflation era. And therefore, I expect in, in history. Uh, central bank balance sheets, we know they've just been, they've never been as high except during wars but we are in peacetime. And finally, debt to GDP ratios, and I'm really talking globally, I'm not talking about any specific region, but debt to GDP ratios, government debt to G G GDP ratios have never been as high before. I mean, the, the closest we came was during the Second World War. So because of this conjunction of uh, very high debt levels, but very, very low interest rates, service costs, debt service costs for the government have never been as low. So if you like the, the, uh, the burden of the debt have never felt so light. So you see that given these conditions, you would like policy to be able to regain room for maneuver to deal both with the inevitable recessions that uh, will come, but also with the unexpected and the COVID crisis was an example of the, of the unexpected. So, and this is a joint task and what's making it so difficult. Again, over the medium longer term, both will have to rebuild room for maneuver. And moreover, going back to what was mentioned earlier, they will have to remain on a sustainable path. You know, I, what I would call a kind of corridor of uh, stability. And what is the ultimate risk? I think again, we sort of got hints of that during the previous presentations. It is that we could actually fall into a kind of instability or, or, or debt trap. By that, I mean that um, monetary policy keeps interest rates low because of its natural objectives. That in turn encourages uh, the government to build up debt. And that makes it harder for monetary policy to raise interest rates when the time comes, when that is needed, without creating problems for the government. And in turn, having difficulties creating problems for the economy. Because remember that there is also quite a lot of private sector debt out there. So. What is gonna make this <clears throat> particularly complicated is that it is a joint task. So that along the way, the, uh, the two policies will, there will be tensions between the two. Because as I mentioned earlier, raising uh, policy rates in order to at some point gain room for maneuver as conditions allow, will make the task for the government more complicated. And the government having to consolidate over time, as we heard uh, before, will put pressure on monetary policy to remain looser for longer. Um, and by, by the way, just to give you a sense of the, uh, the, the, the size of the problem that we're talking about or the challenge that we're talking about, if policy rates or if interest rates were to go back roughly to where they were in the mid 1990s, which was after inflation had already been conquered, so it was reasonable levels historically, then the debt service burden uh, the median debt service burden across the world 
would go back to the peak of the Second World War. I mean, these are really huge, huge numbers. And moreover, as, uh, as Isabel mentioned earlier, once you factor in the fact that uh, central banks have bought so much government debt, uh, it means that something like 30 to 50 percent of long-term government debt in the major jurisdictions these days is actually effectively overnight. So that the sensitivity of that debt to higher interest rates is higher than it was before, although it may look as if government debt is, is very long term. So the, the conclusion from all this, and this goes back to what the governor said earlier, I think that we need to, uh, there is no alternative to this, but to try and raise growth, raise growth on a longer term basis. And for that, there is nothing monetary policy can do, or indeed counter cyclical fiscal policy can do. It is only structural reforms that can deal with that. And when it comes to fiscal policy, you can have growth friendly fiscal policy, by which I mean a growth friendly composition of expenditures and growth friendly composition of taxes. Thank you, uh, Claudio. Uh, perhaps I could turn uh, to you, uh, uh, Jordi, also to discuss some of the risks that we see here as well and not least the rising debt burden. I mean, this is, uh, is, is, is getting ever, ever heavier. And in Spain too, they know, just as uh, in my home country of Ireland, what it's like to live with debts. It's not that easy. And growing out of it is often also hard. Um, where, where do you say the, you see the interplay between monetary and fiscal policy and the potential frictions Okay, well, thank you, John, and thank you to the Central Bank of Latvia for the invitation to be part of this panel. It's a real pleasure. So let me answer your, try to answer your question, but um, let me take a slight detour and follow up a bit on, on, on uh, Claudio's uh, uh, remarks. I don't think I don't think I, I'll be using the slides at this point. So, uh, you, you can remove them. Thank you. Um, so I think it's important to to adopt this uh, um, this medium term uh, perspective and not to to get uh, you know not not let the COVID crisis you know um, permeate all our our views and, and thinking about uh, policy in the, in the years to come. No? So uh, from, in, in that uh, respect, I think it's, it's important to remind ourselves what were the main challenges that uh, the euro area and most advanced economies were, were facing right before the, the, the COVID crisis, especially from the point of view of, of monetary uh, policy and, and fiscal policy. So there, as, as the, the way I see it, there were two uh, such challenges that were uh, widely recognized, uh, particularly by the central bank community. Uh, the first one was the a persistent, possibly permanent decline in the natural or equilibrium interest rate, what we usually call R star, um, due to factors that had nothing to do in principle with uh, uh, monetary policy it had to do with uh, lower productivity growth, demographic trends, uh, change in the preference for um, safe, uh, highly liquid assets, and so on. And in addition to that, uh, what we call in, in academic circles at least the, the decline in the slope of the Phillips curve, the fact that inflation seemed to be less reactive to developments in economic activity. Okay, I think both of these um, developments that we don't, you know, fully um, understand, but at least we 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 we, we, we sense that they are uh, there, or we sense that they were there before the COVID crisis, uh, imply important challenges uh, for monetary policy, and I think those will uh, hunt us back after the COVID crisis is, is gone. Now, on top of that, the COVID crisis has, uh, will make uh, things maybe more challenging because 
um, you know, for the future because of uh, two likely consequences. One is the increasing uncertainty, even if, uh, um, ho no, let's hope the, this pandemic is gone. I think in everyone's minds, the possibility that there are future pandemics and, uh, you know, in the next years or decades is there. And that is a source of uh, additional uncertainty which, if anything, given the impact, given the huge impact that the, this pandemic has had, uh, will um, lead to uh, households, firms, and so on, to increase their savings. And that will uh, put additional pressure, that will be an additional source of a decline in, in our star. Okay. And secondly, as it has been said repeatedly here, the welcome and I think desirable um, strong response of uh, fiscal authorities have, has implied a, a large increase in debt, which may, may become entrenched. Um, so that those are two uh, for, um, important effects that the COVID crisis uh, has that may have, uh, uh, you know, have consequences. Now, the, the the decline in our star that I, I mentioned earlier, I think this this um, define in, in in a way the the, the monetary uh, policy in the years to come. Because even you know even if now we have a more or less strong recovery, and you know things are good enough that um, in terms of inflation performance and, and the, the, the like a level of economic activity being restored and so on, that central banks in advanced economies can uh, raise, start raising interest rates, okay? The question is, you know, how high will those interest rates go, okay? Now, unless, um, you know, in normal, if, 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 if the transition to normality is smooth, let's, let me put it this way, that is if we are not subject to any large uh, adverse supply shocks, I think this will bring back um, policy rates to levels much below um, the levels that they had, say, uh, 20, 30, or 40 years uh, ago. Okay, levels closer to, say, 2% than 4%. And as Claudio was saying earlier, well, this is possibly, uh, you know, these are too low levels, and the, and the, and the policy space that um, those levels imply are is just too 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 small. Okay, so from that point of view, uh, you know, I I think the you know the the the, the strategy review that uh, the ECB has just uh, made public, and I think that has many many dimensions in which it should be praised. I think it has fallen short a bit in terms of. Uh, you know, making the changes needed to create more policy, more policy space, and those changes, if anything, would have uh, should have gone in the direction of uh, a slightly higher uh, inflation target, and uh, a change in the policy rule along the lines of um, adopting, you know, some so-called makeup strategies, average inflation targeting, or something like that, that you know, would ch change in the rule that would eff effectively require less policy space in the future in, or in order to achieve the same degree of stabilization. Now, having said that, and I'll, I'll, I'll stop uh, after this, there is one positive aspect of this, um, or, or, or there's some compensation if, um, um, uh, or a development that offsets some of these negative uh, consequences of the decline in our star that I have, I have emphasized, which is that by itself, the decline in our star, this permanent decline in, in interest rates, if it really if it really remains, it will give us more policy space on the fiscal side, okay? Other things equal, obviously, okay? Because uh, it will make that more sustainable than it was before, hence we should be less, less uh, concerned about the possibility of explosive debt dynamics, and also, it will make uh, it will allow for a higher um, the possibility of higher sustainable uh, deficits cons being consistent with the same uh, debt ratios. Okay, so 
what all this uh, says in summary is that in the future, I think fiscal authorities, you know, will be will have to be uh, will be busier than than our central banks in order when it comes to stabilizing the economy. Thank you very much. We see uh, here as well, I have a small app on my phone, uh, which is why I'm distracted. Sometimes it's showing me the questions from the audience, which are coming in, and uh, they're obviously uh, motivated by the discussion to ask uh, some questions about areas of policy, which is, I guess, in oftentimes a little bit removed from ordinary, uh, ordinary citizens. But we are also offering them a chance to participate in a poll, an audience poll, and that's going to appear shortly on Slido. And um, it is with regards to the likely long-term consequences of this monetary stimulus. Will it be a return to pre-crisis growth without any bad consequences? Will there be distortions in asset prices, asset markets? Will there be significant risks of high inflation, perhaps? And will central banks permanently be on the hawk holding large government debts? So it's a chance for you to uh, vote uh, now. And um, perhaps I uh, can turn to Ma uh, Martin as well with a question from the audience, where somebody asks uh, whether or not these asset purchases have just simply been overdone. They are just far too large. They're huge in the uh, words of the uh, uh, the viewer. Uh, how would you respond to that often, you know, it's an often cited criticism that these asset purchases are just absolutely, uh, uh, you know, overshadow absolutely everything that's happening in the market or the economy? Thank you, John, and uh, thanks for the question uh, to the, from the audience. Uh, two issues. One is uh, take a look at the counterfactuals as such. Uh, what, what would be the likely outcome if uh, uh, monetary policy would have been uh, not that supportive? Okay, that's one thing. Another thing which I also wanted to add to Isabel's uh, uh, answer uh, when she discussed about the operational issues is the proportionality. Uh, we, when taking decisions, and that is very clearly stated in the strategy review as well, when taking decisions, we will always look at the proportionality and we will use those instruments, mix of instruments that is most appropriate for that uh, situation. Okay? And if the existing instruments uh, do not work, we will uh, see whether there are other instruments that are possible. So this proportionality assessments in terms of cost and benefit analysis is always present. Okay? And uh, the current uh, analysis shows that also answering to the question from the audience uh, about the asset uh, purchases at the moment we see that it is beneficial to the economy okay of course uh, you know cost benefit analysis may change okay the efficiency of the instruments could decrease okay so uh, we will keep that in mind uh, when we set the monetary policy that's an important part of our decision making. Um, if I have a chance, uh, I would love, like to add a bit uh, more on the inflation outlook, okay? uh, which already Isabel very clearly explained. And I would like to stress two things, largely transitory. Okay? The current increase in inflation is a hump shape, and I fully agree that it's largely transitory. For instance, the longer the supply side, uh, bottlenecks lost, there is a larger chance that this gets priced in. Of course, uh, some other things in the labor market at some point, I hope, you know, at the end of the day, uh, that is an important part of the mechanism to have 2% uh, sustainable inflation, uh, will be priced uh, from the labor market. Okay? Uh, but even if, and I personally am uh, seeing some of the risks in the forecast, medium term horizon, on the upside, but at the current state, we at most talk of decimals, okay? We don't talk about inflation at 2% or above 2%, okay? So uh, that is a very important uh, decision point that needs to be read through the commentaries is that, you know, 
upside risks to inflation does not mean that we're talking about inflation, you know, running away uh, uncontrolled. Uh, central banks, I believe, of course, it's not going to be easy. You know, there's going to be a political discussion, you know, and all these kind of things. But at the end of the day, central banks do know what to do when uh, inflation uh, starts to run high. Okay? And uh, on a more long-term basis, uh, an effective policy mix requires monetary policy, in my view, to remain independent, which means that fiscal dominance is not a game to play. Okay? And uh, that, to the fiscal part of the equation, to the structural part of the equation, very clearly shows that uh, you know, uh, at some point, with the economy uh, getting stronger, monetary support will decrease, which means that the structural changes in the economy are very necessary. Okay? It's much nicer to grow out of debt, you know, rather than finding other uh, solutions. Okay? So uh, this R star, uh, who knows what's the impact from monetary policy onto R star? There is no uh, clear evidence what drives R star whatsoever at the end of the day. But uh, if something can affect R star and therefore increase the buffers, uh, pushes monetary policy more uh, away from the effective lower bound. This is structural policies that improve productivity, that improve investment environment, that pushes, hopefully, R star higher. So uh, the sustainable answer to this is structural policies. Thank you. Um, I could like to turn with the next question to the studio in Riga, to uh, Valdis, uh, and that is a question from one viewer who asks, what are the incentives for countries like Latvia to keep low debt GDP rates when other countries don't? And doesn't that endanger European cohesion? Uh, well, uh, as regards uh, debt to the uh, GDP ratios, uh, uh, indeed, it must be noted that uh, those uh, vary uh, quite uh, substantially on average uh, in the uh, Eurozone now may be around 100%. Uh, uh, in Latvia, it's uh, slightly above 50% uh, right now and potentially going uh, down. Well, uh, first of all, uh, it uh, must be uh, said that um, uh, if we compare uh, the uh, debt to GDP ratios and uh, sustainability risks uh, uh, which they entail, uh, it's uh, true that depending on the level of economic development of the country and depending on uh, the size of the country, uh, in a sense, sustainability risks uh, vary. Uh, uh, if we look at the uh, previous uh, financial and economical crisis, 2008-2010, uh, uh, Latvia was cut off the uh, uh, debt market with substantially lower public, uh, level of public debt uh, right now. Uh, which means that, uh, in a sense, uh, uh, it's a need to keep uh, a lower uh, debt-to-GDP ratios than maybe a big, uh, bigger countries can uh, afford. So that's, uh, that's economic reality small countries like Latvia is uh, uh, facing. Uh, but then uh, we can also compare, uh, and I'm often using this comparison, uh, Latvia, say, with uh, Estonia, which has still much lower debt to the GDP ratio. Before the crisis, it was around 10% of GDP. OK, now it's maybe slightly uh, higher. But in any case, uh, Estonia has uh, by far the lowest uh, debt to the uh, GDP ratio in the EU. Uh, and the question is, uh, uh, are they uh, uh, really missing something for that? Is uh, uh, on average, economic growth rate lower in Estonia. Are average wages lower in Estonia? Are average pensions lower in Estonia? Uh, and the fact is that uh, it's not necessarily the case. So uh, by uh, uh, pursuing responsible fiscal policy, by uh, pursuing uh, 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 thoughts through structural policies, and Martin was talking a lot about the uh, role of structural uh, policies, uh, actually uh, we see that uh, Estonia is... Uh, uh, growing very uh, successfully, uh, catching up with the uh, EU uh, average uh, economic development levels without building a huge pile of debt. So uh, 
uh, there is a way uh, to develop also by uh, pursuing uh, proper structural policies and uh, not always more debt is the answer uh, for more growth. Of course, the whole nature of debt and money has changed an awful lot. And uh, when the European original debt ceiling of 60% was put into place, interest rates were different and the whole world was different. And uh, is there a need maybe to adjust these kind of strict upper limits, given that we now are in a zero interest rate environment and debt affordability is a lot different to when those were initially put into place. Um, do you see maybe a need to modernize, I suppose, the approach to these upper debt ceilings? Is that is that plausible or possible? Uh, well, uh, as, I, uh, as I mentioned before, uh, European Commission will soon uh, relaunch uh, the public consultation on the EU uh, fiscal rules. So, uh, and uh, of course, we'll uh, do this also taking into account uh, the effects of uh, uh, of, uh, of the crisis. Uh, well, there is a, a agreement within the European Commission that we are doing this within the treaty uh, parameters, so without uh, uh, touching a 3% uh, deficit rule, 60% uh, debt rule, uh, but uh, clearly we will need to have a fresh look how uh, this uh, debt rule is functioning. Current rule is that uh, uh, countries whose debt is uh, above 60% of GDP uh, each year has to uh, close this difference between their debt level and 60% by 1/20th. Uh, uh, and uh, obviously, with uh, uh, this high debt levels, as many uh, EU countries are experiencing right now, uh, it's not really realistic. So we will need to look how we ensure uh, realistic debt reduction uh, uh, pathways. Uh, but it's uh, also true that we are coming out of this crisis with much higher debt levels. So those fiscal sustainability uh, uh, concerns will need to be uh, taken into account and we will need to see how countries are actually putting their debts on sustainable downwards paths also to have a fiscal space when another uh, crisis comes. Uh, and uh, there was an argument indeed, uh, interest rates are now uh, very low already for a long uh, time and that's uh, uh, definitely uh, good for debt servicing costs. Uh, but as a number of uh, colleagues already uh, said, we cannot take it for granted that this is going to uh, last uh, forever uh, if uh, there are, so to say, surprises on the inflation on the upside side, there is a gradual correction of the interest rate environment. Uh, and that uh, puts entirely different pressure on also on the debt uh, sustainability. Also from that point of view, now coming out of the crisis, uh, it's important also to think how we are starting to rebuild the fiscal buffers. Should, should it rather be uh, in the focus of policymakers the serviceability of debt and how affordable it is rather than the overall stock of debt? Has maybe the overall size of the stock of debt lost its relevance really now? given that it's so much easier to, you know, to keep that going? Uh, well, uh, uh, indeed, uh, and this is uh, something uh, which we are uh, certainly uh, factoring in, uh, that debt servicing costs are now uh, much uh, lower, but they are, among uh, other things, much lower due to the uh, unprecedented monetary uh, stimulus which has been provided by the European uh, Central Bank as a response uh, to the crisis and as a response to the fact that inflation for a long time has been uh, below the ECB's uh, target. If you are now uh, uh, starting to discuss that the inflation outlook is actually uh, starting to uh, change, uh, the question is, can we take for granted uh, that this uh, low uh, uh, interest rate environment will last uh, forever? And if we cannot take it for granted, we uh, need to think how uh, indeed uh, to ensure fiscal sustainability in medium and longer term and also coming out of the crisis with very high debt levels we also need to think how to get those debt levels uh, down so that there is a space for maneuver if another crisis uh, comes uh, one of the uh, listeners or viewers has also pointed out that you know the underinvestment in the latvian health system and that's a something they take issue with. 
to kind of broaden that out to a European level, are these new fiscal spending initiatives, including the ones that you've helped organise for Europe, really going to be aimed at infrastructure and succeed in improving Europe's infrastructure? Or is there danger perhaps that some of that money uh, goes down the wrong channels? Uh, well, uh, if we look at the uh, additional uh, fiscal stimulus we are now providing through the recovery and resilience uh, facility, uh, there are uh, clear targets. So 37% uh, of the spending, uh, spending uh, has to go to the green transformation of the economy, so primarily a fight against climate change, 20% uh, to the digital transformation of the economy, uh, and that this spending also needs to be linked with the challenges identified in uh, country-specific recommendations within the European uh, semester, so addressing structural uh, problems in uh, member states. So from that uh, point of view, uh, indeed how we uh, designed a recovery and resilience facility, it's not just to provide a uh, boost uh, uh, to the economy, some kind of short-term a stimulus, but uh, indeed uh, uh, we are aiming to spend this money in a meaningful way, helping the green and digital transition of the economy and addressing uh, structural challenges in the economies. And uh, when you address the point of green investment, some people are a little critical or cautious because they think that this might be uh, exploited or greenwashed to allow countries say that they're making investments for green purposes when in actual fact they're really just running up large debts for the usual kind of expenditure. What type of uh, safeguards do you think we need in place in order to make sure that isn't the case? Uh, well, uh, actually, uh, when we have those uh, green mainstreaming targets, I already mentioned 37% uh, for recovery resilience facility. There is also 30% uh, a mainstreaming target across the multi-annual financial framework 2021-2027. Uh, uh, there is also a clear methodology underpinning what can count towards those uh, green uh, targets. Uh, there is also uh, so-called do no significant harm criteria uh, to ensure that uh, some uh, activity which may be green in one area may be harmful in another area. So uh, we are also watching this do no significant uh, harm. So from that point of view, uh, there are sufficient safeguards in place to ensure that the EU funding, which goes to the uh, uh, member states and which is there for a green uh, transformation, indeed is for economic activities which facilitate this green transformation. Thank you. Maybe I could turn back to uh, Martin because we just have the result of the poll in. And it looks like not everybody is happy with the central bank policy. Uh, the, the most popular response was that these unprecedented moves would end up with central banks holding too much government debt. Um, and also significant high inflation, uh, inflation was another thing which has been highlighted as the, uh, by the audience, as well as distortions in asset prices. So. This would be a kind of a thumbs down a little bit from an audience uh, in our poll uh, to central bank policy. What's your response to that? Uh, as I said, we look at the proportionality issues. Okay? These are all risks that we will consider and we have been considering them. Uh, as to inflation, of course, we already discussed that. As to the asset uh, purchases, we already discussed that, and that is what kind of these risks and these worries very clearly show that uh, monetary policy uh, should stick to monetary policy. Okay? Uh, now, there is, I think the quote that I can use is, is uh, from 1950s. Uh, Bill Martin from the Fed uh, said two things. Uh, and I think it's very much applied at the moment. You know, the, the monetary policy are the bad guys. Uh, those who, when the party starts going too hot, remove the ball of punch, okay? So that uh, it calms down the situation. And another issue, what he mentioned is that, uh, you know, do not overstretch monetary policy. Monetary policy cannot solve all the ills, okay? Uh, you don't go to the dentist if you have something wrong with your leg. Okay. So uh, it's a set of, uh, of policies that need to be used. 
and relying too much on one of the policies could of course cause problems. And, and this is very much so what uh, Claudio mentioned is about rebuilding buffers. Okay? Uh, this is not the last crisis. Uh, there's going to be another one. Who knows when and who knows exactly how will it look like. But uh, monetary policy and fiscal policy will need to react. Okay? And there's going to be much more chance in a sustainable way to react if we have rebuilt buffers. So, unfortunately, I do not have any kind of... Uh, uh, silver bullet saying, you know, don't worry about this. Of course, these are the worries that we should uh, be investi investigating and taking into our decision trees. But uh, by no means uh, monetary policy, uh, you know, I, I think, you know, by all means, we should not fall victim to Stockholm Syndrome, okay, <laughs> in terms of, of thinking, okay, uh, unlimited support to fiscal policy. No. This is only going to lead to bigger problems. Okay? Of course, it has to be done cautiously. It has to be done carefully. Okay? But uh, monetary policy cannot solve all the problems of the world. So, uh, of course, we will pace our decisions along with this. Okay? As to the fiscal story, I think there is one other important issue that needs to be taken into account, which you mentioned at the very beginning, which is the green transition, the climate change. This is a massive cost uh, to the economies uh, going forward. Okay? And there are two ways how to take this cost. One is through climate change and through catastrophes. Another one is through ordinary transition to limit those uh, risks. Okay? And I think ordinary or the or orderly transition is a much better way to go about it, because then the fiscal sustainability risks are also much easier manageable. Thank you. Perhaps I could turn to Isabel there with the general question. This kind of critical response from the poll shows perhaps that a lot of people, a lot of ordinary citizens don't really understand monetary policy, have doubts about it. They maybe see it perhaps in their savings books, uh, in the rising value of property, in some of the kind of inflation that they experience in everyday life. What's your response to those ordinary people who don't understand the ins and outs of the technical work of a central bank? Uh, that's an uh, excellent question, John. Um, and actually, we've, we've also thought about that quite intensively in the context of the strategy review. Uh, because, I mean, as you said, I mean, monetary policy is extremely complicated. And I mean, uh, the whole, I mean, macroeconomics is extremely complicated. And uh, of course, not, not everybody has an economics degree and is able to understand what our star is precisely, what it means when it goes up or down and uh, whatever. And I mean, the language that we uh, typically use, including in today's discussion, is maybe not uh, the language best suited to uh, reach uh, the, the ordinary citizen uh, without an economics uh, degree. And uh, I, I mean, I honestly think that we have to, uh, that we have to work on that. And um, I mean, we've also in the strategy review, we have committed to improving our uh, communication uh, I'm myself uh, trying regularly to do that. Uh, just recently, um, I, I gave a speech on inflation where I tried to uh, avoid a bit these more technical terms and to explain how we think about uh, inflation. And uh, I'm planning to do that again and again in order uh, to, um, I mean, to help people understand because, I mean, the, the worries they have are, are perfectly understandable. And the concerns that are on their minds are at least partly also on our mind. Maybe with one exception. So currently, our main concern is not that inflation is too high. So we still are more concerned about inflation being too low. That may change at some point, but uh, that is still the situation. And this already is, is probably hard to understand for some who see that current inflation rises uh, a lot, uh, which of course has Im an immediate impact uh, on their purchasing power. Uh, but then, uh, of course, one has to remember uh, that there were other times, and we actually just have to go one year back, 
when inflation was actually extremely low. So if you just take inflation over a two-year period instead of a one-year period and then divide it by two, people will see that inflation is actually not that high, even if current inflation looks very high. And I think these are the kind of things that we have to uh, explain um, uh, much better. And um, uh, on the other points, I mean, of course, we are also um, considering what is happening in financial markets. We are looking uh, at uh, asset prices, uh, in particular uh, house prices. Um, and uh, of course, we also, uh, I mean, it's not that our aim is to maximize the size of our balance sheet, right? But uh, we are in a difficult situation. The difficult situation is that uh, our standard policy tool is constrained. So normally in a, in a pandemic like the one we had, we would have done uh, what the, the, the Fed did first, namely lower interest rates. But given that we had already lowered interest rates so much in the past, this was, I mean, we could have lowered it a bit more, but then we also thought this could have even bigger side effects than, uh, than uh, raising the asset purchases. And this is exactly what Martin uh, meant with our proportionality assessment. So we have to, I mean, uh, the one thing we have to consider is how effective our measures, but then of course we also have to look at the side effects. We carefully compare different instruments to see which one is the, the one that is best suited. And of course we have to make sure that the benefits uh, exceed uh, the cost to the best of our knowledge. I mean, this is uh, what, uh, what we can do and um, I think this, this criticism um, from, from the public is extremely uh, important. We take that very seriously. Um, um, and we have to try to uh, explain better what we do. And of course, we are fully accountable to, um, to the public. And we kind of have the obligation to make sure that they also understand what we respond to their concerns. Thank you. Um, uh, I'd like to turn now to uh, Valdes, who is uh, uh, shortly having to, to, uh, to leave. And uh, I, I wanted to... I wanted to, uh, yeah, to turn to you on this point as well, okay. on the cha challenges that this, um, uh, let's say, so many citizens of Europe have kind of misgivings, I suppose, about the monetary and the fiscal uh, policy that the bloc is taking. And I just wonder what your response is to those people who have doubts. We see it perhaps in the kind of increasing divisions that we experience politically in Europe and also uh, the increasing skepticism of ordinary Europeans towards Europe. What's your assessment as to where Europe stands now in terms of political cohesion and also with regards to Europe, the European Union's fiscal architecture and the importance of adjusting that for the euro currency. response uh, to the crisis, uh, I would say that there is a, a large degree of uh, uh, political agreement on the need for uh, ambitious and coordinated European uh, response and that's exactly what has been uh, provided uh, uh, during this uh, crisis. So, uh, of course, always there, uh, there is some kind of uh, criticisms and some kind of uh, 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 discussions, but by and large, I would say there is a relatively broad consensus on the fiscal response which has been uh, taken. Uh, of course, there are uh, certain risks uh, to be watched or dis discussed on the uh, fiscal sustainability side and how we will balance fiscal sustainability considerations with the additional uh, uh, investments we will need in a context of economic recovery and green and digital transitions. Uh, but uh, by and large, uh, I think there is agreement uh, uh, on the fiscal response and also the fact that Europe for the first time was coming with a joint fiscal response funded by common borrowing in the financial markets. Uh, you mentioned also the uh, question on how, what implications it has uh, uh, for the uh, uh, euro area and euro as a currency. Well, it must be said that the trust for euro as a currency right now is at the record high levels. Also, this shows that actually there is appreciation of the euro as a common currency uh, during the crisis and the stability which it uh, provides. 
uh, and uh, once again on fiscal and monetary uh, policy uh, response. So I would not entirely uh, share this uh, uh, pessimistic uh, uh, outlook, uh, but uh, I know Martin also wanted to add a couple of things. <laughs> Thank you, Valdis. If I may, I think uh, there is one institutional aspect here. Uh, there is one monetary policy, and there are many, many fiscal policies. And let's take a look at the Latvian case. Um, small open economy, that can warm up quite quickly. So it is quite possible that the labor market, with all this post-COVID rebound, with all these structural uh, investments going forward, if uh, it happens to cluster around two short periods of time, there is a risk that inflation is significantly higher than one would desire. And monetary policy, which is decided on the euro area as such, of course, would be very limited, if of any, help over shorter term to limit those inflationary pressures. And that's why, as well, kind of for the healthy mix of the, of the policies, structural, to build supply side so that increase in demand does not spill over that much into the prices. And on the fiscal side, to reduce those short-term overheating risks is crucial. Yes, if we compare the Latvian case to 2008, when financial markets froze over and there was no access to liquidity, and there was massive tightening on the fiscal policy part, because that was the only way out. This time, what we saw, what we saw that there was no second, no millisecond of doubt that Latvia would not be able to raise funding in international markets. And that is because we are part of the euro area. So that was a massive, uh, you know, shield from the volatility on financial markets. At the same time, when the economy starts to rebound, the fiscal policy and structural policies have to kick in so that it contains those uh, inflationary pressures in such, such a small economy uh, as Latvia. Thank you. Um, perhaps a, a, another question also to the studio on Riga about the, the problems of an aging Europe and that, what that presents also for debt sustainability. People have talked earlier on about growth and our ability to grow our way out of this, but I guess the, Europe's aging profile means that that's going to be very difficult. Uh, well, uh, indeed, uh, if we look at uh, uh, demographic tendencies uh, in the EU, um, certainly uh, there are uh, challenges uh, we will need to deal with. Uh, and that's uh, why, for example, the uh, questions of uh, fiscal sustainability, including long-term sustainability of uh, pension systems, of healthcare systems, are very much uh, part of our uh, agenda and very much uh, part of European Commission's work. Uh, within the European semester when we uh, deal with the fiscal and macroeconomic uh, policies of the uh, member states, that definitely uh, part of the issues uh, we need to address. Uh, and uh, if you look also at the country-specific recommendations we are addressing to uh, member states, there are uh, quite a number dealing also with the reforms of uh, pension systems and uh, this uh, uh, is uh, also reflected now in the recovery and resilience uh, plans of a number of uh, member states which had those uh, recommendations uh, in uh, this uh, context. Uh, and it's uh, uh, clear as regards uh, sustainability of uh, pensions uh, systems, we need to uh, uh, balance uh, once again the question of uh, adequacy of uh, pensions with uh, sustainability and, uh, uh, in a sense, uh, reforms which are started uh, in a timely and gradual manner, uh, 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 in a time, uh, timely and gradual way, can uh, assure uh, both uh, sustainability and adequacy of pension systems. But the further the pension reforms are uh, delayed, the bigger the challenges are uh, becoming. And uh, also, in a view of aging, of course, we need to seek as broad labor market uh, participation as uh, uh, possible. And this is another uh, issue we pay lots of attention. So the uh, people's skills, making sure that people are equipped with the right skills to the rapidly changing uh, labor market, uh, women labor market participation, uh, uh, elderly workers labor market participation, all the, those uh, issues we also need to tackle. Clearly, Europe's demographic uh, challenge is there and uh, we will need to deal with and we will 
need to uh, uh, factor it in when uh, discussing fiscal macroeconomic policies in uh, years and decades ahead. Thank you, and thanks for participating in the debate, because I understand you have to uh, leave shortly. If I could turn to Matt, and I mean, uh, is there a risk that Europe turns into Japan? I mean, with endless money printing, just uh, keeping and propping up the country uh, in a very artificial way? Uh, I hope not. I'm not a fortune teller, but I think we're doing everything at the current moment so that it is not uh, happening like that. For instance, one of the elements uh, that perhaps has led to a situation that uh, Japan current, currently is in is that uh, you know, there's been stop and go, stop and go fiscal and monetary policies without working uh, jointly. Okay? One policy provides support, the un the another one withdraws. So I think it needs to be coordinated. And that is one of the reasons that from the monetary policy point of view, we have been uh, stressing that withdrawing prematurely support would be a bad choice. Okay? But uh, I do, do not want to draw that close parallels uh, with the Japanese case at the moment. Of course, that is a theoretical possibility, but at the current moment, I think uh, we are miles away from that. Thanks. Um, we have a second survey for the audience now, and uh, that's also available on Slido again, and you can uh, uh, tune in there and, and cast your vote. And that is, what's your view on the significant rise of government debt, whether it was necessary to prevent the collapse, whether debt sustainability will now be a permanent problem or permanent concern, um, whether or not the kind of move for low interest rates and the hopeful kickstart of growth will alleviate high debt concerns in the future, or whether or not you think it's no big deal at all. So you have a chance to cast your vote now, and uh, we'll come back with the result of that in five minutes. But perhaps I could uh, turn to Claudio, and that is uh, to talk about the, uh, you know, the way we calculate inflation. I mean. Uh, uh, People talk about the cost of eggs or fruit and vegetables, but for many people, it's the cost of rent, it's the cost of property that's actually really gone through the roof and accounts for far more of their outgoings. Is the way perhaps we calculate inflation making us blind to some of the implications of the monetary and sometimes fiscal policy that we have now? I think you're uh, on mute. Thanks. Uh, thanks for noticing that. Uh, there are uh, different ways in which one calculates the way in which the cost of um, owning a house, the cost of uh, renting a house is included in the, in the index. Probably the biggest difference is whether you include the imputed cost of owner-occupied occupied housing. Um, now, as I said, there are differences across countries in, in the euro area. There is a long-term uh, project, as Isabel knows too, that uh, will include some of this into the, into the index. But having said all that, um, I don't think that at any given point in time or over time, this is, a big, uh, this is a big issue. Yes, if you include it properly, you will have a better sense of how, how the cost of living goes up. But there have been uh, a number of central banks that, ha that have moved from one to, to the other without any major implications from, from the way that they uh, carry out uh, policy. You may, uh, there may be a one-off change in the inflation rate, but that's, that's effectively what, it doesn't go much beyond that. But having said that, of course, it's good to have a, as accurate a, a, as possible a reflection of the underlying increase in the cost of living. There is, another, there is another aspect, which I think uh, Isabel alluded to, which is probably even more important from a medium and longer term perspective, which is what is the impact of house prices on economic activity and possibly even on the health of the, of the banking system. And there is plenty of evidence, there is plenty of evidence that increases in house prices in the short run 
uh, maybe good, definitely are good for the economy. They go alongside uh, strong economic growth. But in the medium term, in the medium term, they can actually generate headwinds for, for the economy because they could actually turn. And this goes back to, this is not happenstance. This is actually the result of a fundamental change in the nature of the business cycle that we have seen since the mid 1980s. In the old days, uh, you basically had inflation going up quite a bit, central banks having to tighten and that was causing recessions. Since then, given that central banks have done such a good job, it is not so much that which is causing recessions, but it's the big expansion in credit, in asset prices, housing prices, that then turns. So that to me is the more important thing uh, that people should focus on. The, the, cost of, uh, the cost of living, yes, indeed, it's a factor, but many of these changes for the reasons that I mentioned are likely to self-correct in the future. So likely to be more temporary than having a sustained effect on the inflation. Jordi, perhaps I could turn to you. Uh, do you see our calculation of inflation as realistic and are we not maybe perhaps being a little blind to some of the obvious inflation in everyday life? Yeah, I think the way <coughs> inflation is computed um, by master statistical agencies is, is the, you know, the correct way. Of course, there are practical issues uh, that have to do with um, more accurate measurement and so on. I, from that point of view, the, the ECB's initiative to uh, you know, support and uh, the possible revision in the way that uh, owner-occupied housing is, is, is contemplated in inflation measures, I think it is, is should be highly welcome. Um, uh, we know and we have, there are a number of um, studies that show that the, that, uh, you know, um, people tend to uh, put um, disproportionate weight on, on, on items that they purchase with high frequency, even though you know, those items may have relatively little weight uh, when you look at, um, at their purchases over a long period of time, no? in terms of, of uh, the, the, the sharing total expenditures. So that uh, is often a source of um, is often a source of uh, of distortions in the way people perceive uh, inflation, and so in the case of uh, energy prices and, and and gasoline and so on, you no, know, those are very visible in people's minds. Uh, they see the bill every month. They they you know they have to to refill their tanks uh, once a week maybe and so on and that they see but what they don't see um, that often or maybe what they don't think about uh, so much is uh, how it's the fact that the prices of uh, many items mostly uh, manufactured goods have uh, has either de declined in relative terms for sure but also in many cases declined in absolute terms think of uh, computers no? uh, for instance no? and so um, I think it is, it, it's more an issue of uh, educating the public than making, uh, you know, dramatic changes in the way, um, in the way um, uh, indices are constructed, in my opinion. Perhaps I could turn to Isabel and uh, tell you the results of our latest uh, survey, which is that Again, people kind of raise the concern about debt sustainability in some countries as a permanent concern with serious risks for, for tensions. Do you think that the meaning of money, even despite all of the money printing which we have had, is still there? Or has the kind of world entered a new phase when old models of debt absolute kind of stock of debt and all of these kind of old models in which we used to kind of measure our indebtedness and our sustainability. Have they been just overtaken by events? Is the new world just a different place where we don't have to spend as much time worrying about high debt as we did in the past or indeed about high balances on central bank balance sheets and the like? So I don't think that the economics has fundamentally changed. Uh, so I think the mechanisms uh, are, are the same. I mean, of course, some conditions have changed, such as uh, the level of interest rates. But when it comes to debt sustainability, I mean, I would have to come back to the point that um, 
Claudio made uh, at the beginning of our discussion, that the this single most important factor for uh, public debt sustainability is economic growth. And so this is uh, this uh, will be decisive uh, going forward. And uh, this is also why uh, the role of the Commission at the moment is uh, so incredibly important in making sure that all this money that has been made available under Next Generation EU is spent wisely uh, so that um, uh, that the countries uh, get back uh, to a sustainable growth path, um, which then uh, makes the servicing uh, of, of uh, debt, of course, uh, much easier and uh, more or less then automatically also reduces the debt to GDP levels. This doesn't mean that uh, at some point there probably is a time when there's a need for a fiscal consolidation. And again, I would say I fully agree with what Claudio said, that this should be done in a, in a growth-friendly uh, way. Uh, but I think these are, the, these are really the, the, the main factors. Martin, perhaps I can turn to you and ask uh, the same question, but somewhat differently. All of these uh, high debt levels, high quantitative easing, all of these multi-trillions are making people dizzy. And also there's a risk perhaps that they lose a bit of faith or confidence in the money system itself. Um, uh, we see it perhaps one symptom might be the advent of cryptocurrencies, although that seems to be a bit of a speculative bubble as well. But uh, we can see it in some of the answers of the questions today in the polls, and we can see it in some of the questions that were posed. What do you say to ordinary citizens who are a little bit unsure and nervous, and perhaps if where their faith in the monetary system is wavering, what do you uh, say to those people? Helps. Um, gravity is still there, okay? We may think that uh, you know something has changed fundamentally, but it's unlikely. Okay? So too much debt, too much debt is still a problem, and you have those problems when the times are tough. Okay, so uh, it's not always uh, summer and it's not, not always uh, warm. Okay, so in terms of 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 the debt issue, I think of course the, some of the conditions have changed at least temporarily, which means that there's somewhat more flexibility, but at the end of the day, too much debt is a problem. Okay? But coming back kind of to those, these two issues uh, to think about, the current situation uh, of the monetary, fiscal, and structural policies, I would risk to be very simplistic, but I would uh, draw two major conclusions. One, as to inflation, inflation has been low, has been significantly below our target for quite a while. And uh, from the monetary policy perspective, we still uh, consider it to be too low. The current increase of inflation is largely transitory. Okay? From the current standpoint, inflation over the medium term is still below our target. That's point one. Okay? Uh, as to the point two about debt sustainability, uh, of course, monetary policy is not uh, implemented in vacuum. So we need to take into account the economic environment. But that sustainability is is responsibility of structural and fiscal policies. Thank you. Uh, John, well, may, may thank I... you very much. Yes, sorry, Claudio. No, because uh, since this came up a, a number of times, I, I think it is important to underline what the governor said. And let me put it slightly differently. Um, the surest way, the surest way of making sure that uh, debt is going to be a big problem is to believe that it is not a problem. Okay, because that's the surest way of making sure that you will be increasing debt over time because there is no limit, there is no constraint. And the sure, again, to put it slightly differently, if debt in relation to GDP is very high, and if you don't have growth, it will be very difficult for real interest rates to be any higher, because the economy will not be able to sustain them. And we do want an economy to, be, to operate with debt levels that are sustainable when real interest rates are positive, when real interest rates are higher. 
because no economy, as far as I can tell, can operate very efficiently. No way you can allocate capital efficiently if you, for decades, for decades, real interest rates are negative. Going back to what I said, growth is the answer. And definitely what is not the answer is to believe that that is not a problem. Well, on that note, I'd like to thank everybody, Isabel, Jordi, Claudio, Valdis, Martin, for participating in a fantastic discussion. Uh, I think it brought the subject of fiscal and monetary policy close, closer to a, to a wider audience. And, and thank you very much for your participation. Thank, Thank you very you. much to everybody. Thank you very much for this first panel discussion. We will be uh, back and continue with the second panel discussion after break. Uh, the title of this discussion is Moving Towards Sustainable Development. But before short break, uh, I would like to ask you uh, to give quick feedback and comments uh, in our Slido session. Use still the same uh, hashtag LB conference, LB conference. Uh, as Martin said, gravity is still there, and gravity of today's conference will bring us back in a few minutes. Please take your coffee and see you uh, at uh, 3 and 35 minutes Riga time. 3 35 Riga time. See you. Thank you.